Dames en heren, goeienavond. Welkom bij die laatste Science Café van hier die jaar van die woordfeest, bij een speciale geleentheid, vrolijk, wijn. Ik kan niet samen drinken, ongelukkig niet, ik drink niet. Maar ik ga samen dunk met jullie. Science Café is a platform of the University Faculty of Science, which brings us closer to what we don't understand about science. And tonight's a very special one for me because I am interested in smells, uh, particularly perfume, not, not really what it smells like, but what it does to your mind. Uh, well, I know what alcohol does, but <laughs> we have um, Professor Wessel de Toe, who uh, did most of his studying here at this university. And I'm not going to spend too much time on CV because I don't understand it really. Um, but he ends his little brief introduction by saying he loves his wife, two sons, Shannon Blankwein, and Chalyun in that order. <laughs> now, um, I, 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 I think that's enough. Then we also um, have Jean Brandt, who is a very special person in a sense that she um, uh, she's a sensory specialist. In other words, she tries to figure out what things smell like. Now, if you cook potatoes, everybody knows what it is if you bake a bread. But if you combine potatoes, bread, a bit of gumboot sweat, and perhaps cabernet, your nose and your mind really gets confused rather quickly. And how do we tease out these components? And how do we describe them? Because the other problem we have, we don't have a proper lexicon. To, to describe smells. It is thought that the complexity of smell description and color description is an indication of civilization or being civilized. Um, you know, you can either say sweet or sour, or then you can go into a lexicon of smell. So we're going to test them for their levels of civilization as well. What I find particularly appalling about wine is the incredible tsunamis of rubbish that is talked about it. Um, I was listening the other night to a well-known wine critic. Uh, well, I must be careful now. Anyway, so he said, it was a frivolous little wine, you know. Um, with uh, hints of Feinbos grass. So I phone him, I say, listen, M, Feinbos doesn't have grass in it. What the hell are you talking about? Fe what is Feinbos grass? Oh, well, he said, you know what I mean. I said, I have no idea what you mean um, by Feinbos grass. Lastly, I'll give over to you guys right now. I have a particular interest in the cultivar Ferdinand de Lesseps, I'll have you know, which is an appalling grape. Um, which smells of pineapple. Uh, it's a rather clammy wine. So I looked up the classification of aroma from the hybrid Ferdinand de Lesseps by colleagues of yours, Rogers and Van Weyck. And this is what they found. It had 31 flavor compounds and it concluded, sorry about this, um, by saying that it would appear that, that the as though the hybrid note of Ferdinand de Lesseps could most likely be attributed to the presence of O amino acephenone and 2,5 dimethyl 4 hydroxyl 3 bracket 2 H furanone, whether the esters ethyl butanoate and the ethyl and methyl esters of 3 hydroxy butanic acid and the, to a lesser extent ethyl 3 hydroxy hexanoate and ethyl 3 hydroxy propanoate are more than likely responsible for the pineapple aroma. Could you two please explain that? You, you need a few glasses of wine to understand that, I, I believe. Thank you, Dave. Um, thank you, everyone, for joining us tonight. Uh, really appreciate you coming here. Um, thank you, Dave, for the kind introduction. Uh, my name is Wessel de Toe, and my colleague here is Jean Brandt. So, from the Department of Viticulture and Technology at Stellenbosch University, um, one of our colleagues, um, Vida, can you perhaps just, where is Vida now? 
you just look at the presentation quick, please. One of our colleagues um, at the chemistry department, Andre de Villiers, he was supposed to be here tonight as well, but unfortunately he's sick, so, so we're going to talk to you tonight about the, um, the chemistry of wine as well as the... Um, Jean is going to talk to you about the sensory, as, as Dave mentioned. So, um, the chemistry of wine is obviously a difficult um, subject, and it's a quite a complex subject. Um, as you will see tonight, more than a thousand different molecules have already been um, found in wine. And I think we just touched on the tip of the iceberg. There's probably many more. And I think maybe in 500 years' time, or I hope not now, we will know if I give you a glass of wine and I can analyze, or you give me a glass of wine, hopefully my children's 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 children will be able to analyze you and tell exactly what is in that glass and what compounds are there and how do they, how do we perceive them. At this stage we can't do that. That's interesting, you know, we don't make coke, we make wine, which is obviously much more complex and interesting than, than coke. Yeah, so the wines we're going to taste tonight is from Audi Lan wines. Um, nothing to do with Seven Delan, obviously. We were there long before Seven Delan. <laughs> Those of you who know Stellenbosch, Delan is situated in between um, at Kutzenberg. So the cellar is between Kutzenberg and Paul Ruiz Gymnasium. And I would like to, I'm doing some advertising now for the cellar as well. I would love you to all visit the cellar. I would, li like, it, well, would like to extend a, all a welcome to you to go and visit the cellar. Um, between 9 and 4 o'clock, you can go and taste wines there. Um, you can see over there is our winemaker. He looks, he's normally, normally not that friendly, but after a few glasses of Pinotas, everyone will be friendly. So um, he's there, his name is Rian Vassung, and he'll be happy to, to, um, to assist you, and you're welcome to go and taste wines. You can also buy wines there. We've given you a price list there of our wines, and you will see very good quality for money. <coughs> um, so yeah, if you want to be a Marty, they say you must have a rewrite, you must, what are the four, your icon must fall on your head, you must kiss someone in the line, and you must also drink a bottle of pinot de line, and you're a, a real Marty. Okay, so people often ask me, what is the difference between red and white, what do you think is the difference between red and white wine? The color, yeah. <laughs> One, <laughs> that's, uh, that's the very good answer. That's basically the difference between red and white wine. Um, I asked my wife, she's not here now, she's coming a bit later, to, to press the juice out of a, out of a grape skin and took me about 20 shots. She was a bit irritated after that. But basically, as you can see, the color coming from your, white, your red grapes is actually colorless. So one can actually make a, red, a white wine from red grapes. Um, but you obviously cannot make uh, a, a red wine from white grapes. So in the skins and in the pips, a lot of the molecules are situated, which actually give a specific taste to red wine, and we'll touch on that later tonight. So just quickly, the difference between red and white wine production. On the left, we have white wine production, so the grapes come in. The grapes is first distinct. That's a, a machine that basically removes the stems from the skins um, of your white wines. The reason for that is the stems contain a lot of tannins, which, give white, which can give white wine a stringent taste. And then after the, the, the stemming process, the wine goes into a press. A press is basically just a big balloon, which presses the juice from, this, from the skins. Um, and then after that, the, the, the wine goes into a fermentation tank, um, where we ferment around about two weeks at a low temperature, at 14, 15 degrees centigrade. So South Africa was actually the first country who did cold fermentations in white wines, and that leads to much more fruitier white wines. After that, it can go into a barrel like Chardonnay or certain Chenin Blancs, or into another tank where the wine is matured for a while. After that, the wine is cooled down for about two weeks at quite a cool temperature. Have some of you seen some of these crystals forming in wine underneath the cork? I think you drink your wine too quickly because no one has seen to see it. If you, if you keep a red wine for a while, um, often you see these crystals underneath the cork. Those are called potassium bartartrate crystals and they form naturally in the wine over time. So that cooling process is basically to remove those crystals, um, to remove the crystals so it doesn't form late, later on in the, in the bottle. Um, yeah, obviously we want to drink our wine, we don't want to chew it, so it's important to, to remove those crystals before bottling. If we make red wine, we have um, a bit of a different process. The grapes come in, they also distend, and then it goes into a tank, but as you can see, 
The pressing in red wine happens after fermentation. So the reason for that is we need to extract that color from the skins. And those color molecules is called anthocyanins. We'll discuss them a bit later again. But during fermentation, the winemaker would mix the skins and the, and the, and the um, juice often to extract the, the color from the skins and also the tannins from the pups. And then after fermentation, it's pressed. As you can see, the press over here. And the wine is pressed from the skins. And from there, it can go into a barrel for about a year, which also gives a certain positive taste to the wine. And from there, the wine is filtered and bottled. So that's a very broad, quick overview, the difference between red and white wine. Obviously, it differs a lot between different cultivars and different styles of wines. But I think at least you know now what's the difference between red and white wine production. So <coughs> if we look at, at wine tasting, as Dave said, we obviously have a few senses. We, can, we, we see things, we hear things. Okay, you can't really hear anything in wine. Um, some people can, but I think that's late at night, obviously. <laughs> um, you also can't really touch wine. You only can put your finger in the glass, just your own glass tonight, not your neighbor's, please. And, but what we actually perceive in wine is what we see what we and what we taste and what we smell. And Jean's going to tell us a little bit later about what we actually smell in wines, but um, those are the main things that we actually perceive when you evaluate or taste wines. Can you hear? Yeah. Um, my job is fascinating. I measure human perception, and that is a very variable factor. It's very different from what Vessel and Andre does. They measure um, variables with an instrument. For me, my instrument is a panel of people. And what we want you to um, understand a little bit more about this, of this evening or afternoon is how we do that. So there's various ways of doing that. There's technical wine tasting, which is something that you would do in a wine cellar. And we could use that as a scientific way of collecting data. But then there's also sensory analysis, which is slightly different. It has an element of experimental design and then very complicated statistical analysis. What we are doing today is more technical wine tasting. And there is a sequence in which this is usually done. And this, is, uh, this was invented or proposed by UC Davis, which is a university in the USA. And um, they start by looking at the appearance of a wine, and then the aroma. And the last step would be the taste. Vita, if you can give me the next slide. OK, so this is how they proposed to do it. And this was published in a scientific journal. And um, they also propose a wine aroma wheel. And what's not on this slide, which we will talk about later, is there is also one for taste and mouthfeel. So what you would do first, you would look at the wine, the color, and also if there's any precipitate in that. And then um, it, they, it's common to give it a score out of three. So there's a score sheet that comes with this also. And then the next step would be to, look, um, to evaluate the aroma or the bouquet of the wine so that's mainly smelling and you can give it a quality score and that's typically in industry out of seven um, for sensory analysis we're not always or most of the time not interested in quality so we want to wa want to know what does it smell like so i want to know descriptors what do you smell in the wine does it smell oaky does it smell fruity or maybe a hint of green and then the next step would be to taste the wine and to also evaluate the mouthfeel. And um, there's two aspects to taste and mouthfeel. There is what you perceive in mouth. And then after you expectorate or spat out the wine, what stays behind? The length and the aftertaste. And then the uh, last thing that people would do is they would think about the overall impression that they left with after they've completed this whole process. So, um, yeah, that's basically technical wine tasting. And that sums it up. So it's the appearance, the aroma, then the body and the taste, and the finish, what you are left with, and your overall impression. So let's talk a bit more about the aroma perception. There's two ways of perceiving aroma. You can perceive aroma by just smelling the wine, and we call that orthonasal. That's through your nose. And then you can also perceive aroma when you drink a wine. And that's called retronasal. That's via the back of your throat. 
So um, I don't have the arrows on this picture, but orthonasal would be this way and retronasal would be that way. I'm not going to bore you too much with the physiology of aroma perception, but it's a very direct mechanism. It's via your taste buds and um, sometimes via your uh, trigeminal nerve. That's more a direct. You can think of that almost as a reflex reaction, but it's very closely connected to your brain. So what we do to help us with aroma perception is we commonly use aroma wheels. So these you can find various types. The one that we have here was developed in South Africa at the ARC just around the corner. And this is the pinotage aroma wheel. So you'll see that you have different tiers in this wheel. The middle one will be, for example, spicy, fruity, and then it's subdivided into different spices. Now we find often that when people are quite new to wine tasting, it's very easy for them or for some of them to at least identify the middle tier. Is it spicy or is it fruity? But it's difficult and you need to practice a bit to say exactly what spice you are smelling. Come on. Okay, so um, you have some bottles on your table and some Petri dishes. The Petri dish is that transparent container. So what you can do next, we have a little exercise. You can smell all the bottles. They're marked one to six. And there's a chemical in that bottle. It's not harmful. Don't worry. It's naturally abundant in wine. So there's a chemical. And then there's the Petri dishes marked one to six. So try to match the chemical with the fruit. So you can smell all of them. Do you have that? Yes? There's only 10 sets, so see if you can borrow maybe from the people next to you. Okay, so you can smell those um, compounds and try to match them and see who's correct. Um, <laughs> Yeah, please just pass it around at the table. We, not, we won't have to take a very long exercise for me, just for interest's sake. Um, the one who's got everything right can have the most, can have a bottle of wine tomorrow on the cellar. <laughs> um, we are also starting to pour some wines now for you. So, everyone who's got two glasses in front of you, just let the ladies pour the wines for you, please. We will tell you just now what is what, what is in the container, so you can um, see if you recognize it correctly. Okay, so everyone wants, anyone wants to take a guess, what is number one? What is number one smell of? Did you all smell number one? Butter. Butter. Anyone agree? I've got a butter here. <laughs> Let's skin. Vanilla. Okay. <laughs> Are they actually quite close? But butter and vanilla is, is not is quite close in wine actually.
Ja, det er ikke så der, Bjerde. Skal det gælde nummer 1, Lian? Ja. Hva? 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 Nummer 1. Nummer 4. Ja, jeg vil gerne skrive en bedre måde. Nummer 1. Nummer 4. Nummer 4. Nummer 4. Nummer 4. Nummer 4. Okay, so I will give you a hint. Actually, a tip here, by van die gere wat jylle, of meeste van die gere wat jylle kan reik, is daar op die, op die skerm. So, kijk of jylle die goed bykie kan by mekaar kry. Can you match certain of the flavors? Die vreem uit jy begin verval, maar dit is raar. Hoe kan dit nou uit? Maar jy het begin. Wat kan jy vir die sê? Wat kan jy vir die sê? Okay, so, we had a nomination for number one, and some people thought it's butter. It is not butter. There is an envelope on your table, and that has all the answers. So you can open the envelope. The card has two sides. The one side has the number, and the other side has the picture and the structure of the chemical. So what are you going to do with number one? What are you going to do with number one? Ja, misschien kan ons net iets sê oor die chemikalie wat ons gebruik het vir Grenadella. Dit is iets wat baie vinnig afbreek. So as ons daarmee werk in die laboratorium, moet ons seker maak, ons voeg dit eers by die oplossing 20 minute voor ons begin proef. Anders begin reik dit later soos iets anders. Dit verander. So, die naam van die chemikalie is 3 merkap to hexanol en daar is, ek dink, nog 2 of 3 van die chemikalie wat baie nabij aan die selfde is. Hier die ene, as een mens die concentratie veel meer maak, begin reik dit soos een tomate blaar. En dan, as jy nou jou timing recht krijg, dan in die helfte van jou sensoris is, sê sê, dan sê die dames op my paneel vir my, Nou reik dit nie meer soos een tomate blaar nie, wat het jy hiermee gemaakt, dit reik nou soos een grenadella. That's nothing, that's nothing to do with what we do, it is the nature of the chemical compound. Of as die concentratie baie hoog is, dan reik soos een ou wat langklaas gestort het ook, blijkbaar, so, wat of jylle dit ook reik nie? En wie van jylle reik ook koeial wil in nummer 1? Iedereen wanneer smells guava in nummer 1? Nou 1, oké. Dit is nummer 2. Wat denk jylle nummer 2? Wat is jy smelle nummer 2? Wat is nummer 9 soma tafel? Dani, wat denk jylle nummer 2? O, ja, ok, vol punte. Het jylle ook nummer 2 green pepper gereik, of groen rissie? Do you all smell green pepper nummer 2? This is this molecule, molecule called is... 2 isobetyl 3 metoxypyrazine of betoxypyrazine en ons sal later sien, dit speel vir belangrike rol by Sovio Blank en ja, partij rooi kultivars ook. Ok, en number 3, what did you smell in number 3? That is a difficult one. Banana, did you smell banana? That's good. A lot of people tell me it smells like a banana sweetie. It's a sweet banana. Um, Andrei, who can't be here this evening, was my Demi when I was first year and second year. And we had to make this chemical. And we were all slightly mad at him <laughs> because you smell like that banana for the next two weeks. So <laughs> it's something that's not too difficult to synthesize and second year students can do it. It does occur in wine. Um, we find it not very often but it's called isoamyl acetate. What are you number four? Is it all for? What are you number four? Number four. What are you number four? 
Number four. Iemand daar achter, wat ek julle nummer vier. Rama. Is dit botte? Ok, dit is botte, diacetyl. Botte is een molekiel wat, of diacetyl kreeg ons vooral in Chardonnay, is een type van goed. Ok, vijf. Wat het jy smelle nummer vijf? Vanilla, ja. Ok, vanilla kreeg ons vooral ook in Chene Blanks, het kom van jou hout af. En dan die laatste een. Pepe, ja. Ok. Swaak pepe gee, kreeg ons vooral in Shirase. En dit is een molekiel wat ons Rotando noem. Die Australiërs het baie lang gesikkel om die molekiel in hulle Shiraz te identificeer. Klomp gelde aan spandeer in die project. Het het nou net een gedink, maar hoekom kyk ons hier wat een swaak peper is hier. Kyk ons wetenskapelik is nie so slim as dit hulle dink hier. Dit gaan toetsen hulle toe sien hulle, maar dit is die selle molekiel wat een swaak peper voorkom. Sy naam is Rotando en hy gee ook vir ons die swaak peper karakter in Shiraz en bitte ander woei weinig. Goed, ek wil net so vinnig bykie gesels oor die verskillende concentraties van die molecules. So just quickly at what levels molecules occur at in wine. Just to give you an idea, we got a lot of different molecules in wine. You can see we have esters and acids. Now these things occur, well not occur, but we normally smell them in milligrams per liter. Milligram per liter. Om vir julle idee te gee, as ek sê, As jy een van die molekules aan 6 korrelkies sout kan mee vergelijk en jy gooi dit in een liter water, dan gaan jy dit basis kan reik. As jy het echter, dan kry ons een tweede groep van molekules wat meer vernoole en terpene is. As ons die 6 korrelkies in een 1000 liter swembad gooi, dan gaan ons dit kan reik. So ons is baie meer sensitief vir terpene bijvoorbeeld as vir sekere esters. And terpenes, you will find all over if you go tonight home and tomorrow morning wash your hair with with shampoo, there's a lot of terpenes in shampoo, like citronello, nerol, and so forth, which gives shampoo those nice, um, you know, citrus flavors and so forth, rose. And then we get a last group of molecules, for instance, called pyrazines, we get other molecules as well, which we normally smell at nanograms per liter. Now, to give you an idea, if I take six of those grains of sand and I add it into an Olympic-sized swimming pool, you'll be able to smell it. So, ons is verskrikkelijk sensitief vir die molekules, die bijvoorbeeld die green pepper, is een metoxipiracine, ook die passion fruit, die eerste en is ons op die selwe vlak sensitief vir die gere. So, ons is baie, as mense, so jy kan sien die reins, of die, ja, die reins wat ons goed in wijn kan reik, kan baie verskil. Die ose terrasies wat die goed in voorkom, kan ook baie verskil in wijne. Hierdie ga ek maar net vinnig deegaan, ons kan ook sien, sekere afgeere kom ook voor in wijn, soos die les toeplaast en medicinaal, en bij die goed sal betek die vrug in die wijn onderdruk, wat natuurlijk nog nie een baie positieve afspek is. Dan het amal wijn gekry, amal wit wijn gekry, is iemand oogeslaan met die wijn, ek hoop jy so nie. Ok, so net gaan vinnig voor ons proe, Ons het twee wijne wat ons vanavond gaan proe, is Sovio Blank en is Chene Blank. Al twee is gemaakt by die Laan Kelder. Sovio Blank is very popular in South Africa. It's probably the white wine that people drink the most of in South Africa. Normally more a fresh fruity summer wine. And we normally get flavors of a bit of green pepper, a bit of fruitiness in Sovio Blank. Then we have Chene Blank. Chene Blank is, South Africa is actually the country with the most Chene Blank planted in the world, about 18% of our vineyards consist out of Chenin Blanc, and there's really a movement now to increase the, the um, visibility of our Chenin Blancs. We make wonderful Chenin Blanc wines in South Africa. Van jylle het ook sikkel gehoor van die ouwe wingerde, wat ouwe as 35 jaar oud is, ons noem maar die ouwe wingerde van al Chenin Blancs, wat nou bijvoorbeeld in die Swartland en Stellenbosch van die areas baie gewild raak en baie uitstekende wijne produceer. So, ek sal graag dat jylle die twee wijne wil kan proe, aan die linkerkant, denk ek, boot jylle Sovio Blank te wees, 
en aan die rechterkant dan die schoene blank. So jylle is welkom om die twee weinig te proe, te vergelijk met mekaar, en een beetje terugvoer vir ons te gee, asjeblief. Is die wijn lekker? Jylle sal sien, die Sovio Blanc is meer een lichter varse wijn met een bykie hoer sier, terwyl die Sovio, excuse, die Sovio Blanc, terwyl die Schoenen Blanc is een gehoute wijn, bykie swaarde wijn, bykie hout geer wat ook al voorkom, bykie my ruip vruchte geer. So die Sovio Blanc, you can definitely enjoy with something like a salad or even some seafood, whereas the Schoenen Blanc, which is more a fuller, ruiper wijn, one can dive that perhaps with some chicken dishes or also some, some other seafood types of, perhaps a bit more richer type of dishes. Yeah, the donker the one is the, is the Chenin Blanc and the lichter one is the Sovio Blanc. Yeah, okay. So you can see the, um, the Chenin Blanc is a bit more yellow clear. This is a form of the oud. The oud is also a bit more yellow clear. Okay, so did you all taste two wines? Did you enjoy it? It's like a ne. Okay. Let's move on to red wine. Um, you can see red wine, obviously. <coughs> We also look at the appearance of the wine, and red wine, obviously, the color of the wine is important. We want a nice, deep red color. Um, the aroma, we also smell the aroma in red wine. Red wine is often a bit more complex than white wine because we have the influence of the wood and also some aging. Red wine is often aged a bit longer than white wines. And then in the taste in red wine, obviously, are influenced a lot by phenolic molecules. Phenolic molecules, I'll explain a little bit to you just now which gives the stringent and bitter taste to red wines. It also contributes to the mouthfeel of, of our red wines. So the two wines we're going to taste tonight is a Merlot and, uh, and a Pinotage. Two wines that we've made. Okay. Yeah, before I forget, you, you, can, you can throw out your wines in, the, in the spittoons or you can just swallow them. It doesn't matter as long as you don't spit it out. <laughs> so you're welcome to, to throw out your wines into the spittoons because we're going to pour the red wines in the same two, two glasses. Okay, just some flavor compounds we find in red wines. You can see again the metoxypyrazines. I'm not going to spend too much time on this, but if you look at the structure of these molecules, they look quite similar. But you can see just a little bit of an extra group here makes the molecule smell quite different. Anything ranging from green peppers to um, peanuts to potatoes. So, that the, so the flavor of a molecule depends a little bit. A small change in, on the molecule can actually have a large influence on how we perceive that molecule, how do we smell that molecule, and also the level of the molecule also influence, or the concentration it occurs at in the wine, will also influence how do we actually perceive it. Um, here can you see a few hout components. Um, this comes from like eike hout, here is not the eike boom here by us, but um, eike boom here is one there. So. En jylle weet, dit is alle bome wat ons, wat jylle daar so sien, wat in Oost en Frankrijk en Amerika gebruik word om vir eike vaten van te maak. Ons kan nie ons eie eike bome gebruik hier, want die bome groeit bykie vinnig en die hout is die kernhout wat gebruik word vir een vat, is in Zuid-Afrika gewoonlik vrot, of dit is nie so bad, dit is te sag. So normally the barrels comes from France or America, it's produced from Quercus Suber or Quercus Cecilis, the oak trees, en I don't know if you know how much a oak barrel costs these days. It's about 15 to 20,000 rands for one barrel, which is about, you can store 225 liters of wine in a barrel for about, you can use a barrel basically three times or three years. So that's why um, red wine is quite a expensive, it's quite expensive to produce red wine compared to white wine because of the, 
Dat ook influence, ook kost. So van die gere wat ons in uitkoud krijg, kan jullie zien vanilla, jullie die vanillin voor het gereik, ons krijg vir vooral, 5 metiel vir vooral, wat meer toffie, um, chocolade gere het. Ons krijg ook ons eike lactone, eike lactone kan je vooral in whisky, die van jullie wat Jameson's drink, mens krijg vooral eike lactone en Jameson whisky, want hulle hou die whisky ook in eike vaten, en dat geeft voor ons een kokosneet of een eike vat, of een eike, of een eike hout gee. Then we also get spicy, eugenols, got a eugenol, you all know how cloves smell like. There's a lot of eugenol in cloves and also in oak wood that contributes to the spiciness in red wine. And then we also get gaiacol and 4-methyl gaiacol, which got a smoky, savory aroma. I don't know if you're familiar how they produce oak barrels, but if they produce oak barrels, they normally toast the barrels where they put the open barrel over a fire and the toasting actually leads to these molecules being formed. So baie van die molecules wat jylle hier so sien op die boot, wat gevormd door die, die, die roostering van die eike, eike hout. As jy die eike boom net so gaan vat, en die stave, ek wil amper sê, van die rauwe hout maak, gaan baie van die gere nie voorkom in die hout, en ook in die eventueel in die wijn nie. Goed, um, Net so'n bykie, bykie chemie, ons moet ons een bykie gesels oor chemie, hierdie is een molekiel, ons gaan nou bykie terug gaan na die, hoe ons wijn, hoe ons wijn sien, hierdie molekiel is eindelijk die molekiel wat die rooi kleer en rooi wijn gee. Die molekiel sy naam is anthocyanin, en jylle kan sien die bekendste in wijn is malvedien, hierdie molekiel is gebind aan glikose, en jylle kan sien daar is een positieve lading op die molekiel, nou dit veroorzaak dat die molekiel die groen spektrum van licht absorbeer en die rooi spektrum van licht weer kaats. Dit is amper die tegenovergestelde van een plant wat, wat groen is. So, dit maak het, dat rooiwin rooi is. Anders was rooiwin ook blauw of groen of van ander kleer gewees. So, malbedien of anthocyanine, ons kruile ook in, in um, aardbeie en appels en die type van goed. Nou, ons begin is een bykie meer met chicken wires. Ek, my studenten praat altijd van chicken wires, so ek gaan nie te veel die tijd hierop spandeer nie, maar jylle kan sien, die molekiel kan vier verskillende vorme in rooiwin hee, afhangende van die pia. So as jy rooiwijn sy pia opstoot, dan raak rooiwijn eindelijk blauw. So one day if you're at home, you've got a strong base, add some to red wine, and you will see the wine actually becomes blue. If you add a strong acid to red wine, the red wine's color becomes much more dark red actually. Misschien dat jylle as studenten goedkoop rooiwijn gedrink, en dan sien jou tong raak blauw. Dit is mys gevolg van die pia, jou pia in jou mond is heel wat hoer as die van rooiwijn. Dit is soekom, dan die molekiel raak blauw, dus ook om je tong ook blauw raak. En dan net so'n bykie verder oor wijnkleer, ek gaan nie te veel tyd hier aan spandeer nie, jylle kan sien, dit is redelijk complex van die molekules wat vorm van die goed vorm van af oxidatie komponente af, en die molekules raak oor tyd al hoe groter. So these molecules become bigger over time, normally in a young red wine, these um, anthocyanin molecules are quite small and simple, and the wine has got a deep, um, basically red, red purple color, but as the wine mature, the wine's color changes into more a brick red or brown color when the wine is actually quite old. This is because of these more complex um, pigments that's being formed during red wine maturation. Okay, and here can you see, we're amper now by a hooner ook al, I think we're going to more complex to work. <laughs> and, um, yeah, now we're going to tell you a little bit about the smell of the Oké, okay, so helfte van my werk gaan oor aroma en die andere helfte gaan oor hoe smaak dit. <laughs> nee, is nie helemaal so eenvoudig nie. Um, if you want to talk about taste perception, it's slightly more complicated if you think about the mechanisms than aroma perception. We have taste buds and I think you all know that. So we perceive sweet, sour and bitter and umami. Umami is not something that we perceive in wine, but the mechanism for that is... Um, taste bud orientated, if I can put it that way, so you perceive that with your taste buds. But then there is mouthfeel, and this is important for us as wine chemists, wine analysts, and even winemakers, because that contribute to the body of the wine, and you will often hear that people talk about the body of a wine, and if it's a full wine or if it's a watery wine. Mouthfeel plays a very important role there. And one of the attributes of mouthfeel is astringency. So astringency, and Vessel just told you about anthocyanins. So astringency is perceived 
when you taste the wine and you have that mouth dry, your mouth feels dry all of a sudden. And then it takes a while for most of us before your mouth feels coated again. So what happens here is that the anthocyanin binds to the protein in your saliva and then it precipitates. And when that happens, then you don't have anything that's coating the inside of your mouth or it's less coated and you perceive that mouth drying feeling. But astringency is not only astringency, you get levels of astringency. So it's called, um, it's called a tactile sensation. So it's, if you think about the word tactile, that's something that we, the word that we use when we touch things. So um, at Stellenbosch University, we had a researcher, Anita Oberholzer, which is not, unfortunately, at our department anymore, but they developed a mouthfeel wheel where they linked that to tactile sensation. They gave people different pieces of fabric, like linen and silk, and I think they even used sandpaper. So if you perceive astringency at a very um, intense level, then you would use the sandpaper, and if it goes away quite fast and the mouth coating effect comes back after a, a short while, then you would maybe rather use the linen. So they developed this astringency and mouth feel wheel. But lately we've discovered it's even more complex than that. We've tasted some Chenin Blanc from old vines. And then astringency is not the factor that's most important. Then it's more about mouthfeel and the body of the wine. So we are still working on this. This is very complicated. But to just give you an idea what you could, if you look at the words here, you can talk about fine, emery, velvety, suede, silk, and that would all be smooth mouthfeel sensations. And then drying, which could be dry, packering, numbing, then they also have dynamic, which they call chewy, grippy, and adhesive. We found that people um, with not a lot of experience like to choose silky, grippy, and astringent. So that's what they typically use for mouthfeel description. The mouthfeel is it's very complex. So um, if we go to the next slide, you can see that the structures are quite complicated that causes these um, mouthfeels. Um, then if you look at that structure, so this is vessels chicken wire or chicken <laughs> mesh structure, the more complicated the tannins become, the more um, polymerization could occur over the aging process. So this molecule becomes large. And when it becomes too large to bind properly in your mouth, then you again will get the sensation, what's called a soft, soft tannin sensation. So the astringency will not be as severe as when you taste a younger wine. So I don't know, Vesel, do you want to add on that? Yeah, no, this is exactly what happens during wine. If you taste, those of anyone who made wine here, I see one or two people who've made wine here. There's a few people. So if you taste a very young red wine that was basically just finished with fermentation, it normally tastes a bit bitter and very astringent. Then after six months or a year, the wine tastes a bit more stringent, and then after another year or two, the wine actually tastes much softer. That is because this molecule starts to bind to each other, and as Jean mentioned, if they become quite large, it's more difficult for your taste um, receptors in your mouth to bind to them, and the wine actually tastes softer. So the tannin flakken in wijn nemen niet af niet, dus eigenlijk wanneer die conformatie van die molecuul wat verander, so dus ook omdat voor ons anders te proe as wine begin ouwe word. Goed, um, die laaste twee wijne wat ons vanavond gaan proe is twee rooie wijne, um, wat ook by die laan gemaakt is, die ene is een Merlot en die ene is een Pinotage. Um, Merlot is gewoon, ek heb hier van een zachte rooie wijne, as iets soos Cabernet bijvoorbeeld, alhoewel hy ook een goeie tannin structuur het, ek dank hierdie Merlot van ons, het een goeie tannin structuur, en dan gaan ook een bykie Bessie en Misschien een beetje van haar groen rissie geer op die wijn kry. Het die Merlot ook een gouden medaille by Veritas gewen, wat ons nationale jongwijnskou is, waarop ons baie trots is. En dan ons Pinotas is eindelijk ons vlagskip. Um, ek weet nie of julle bewis is, maar die kultie waar Pinotas is by ons departement gekweek in 1925-24, door professor Abraham Perlt. En um, hy, hy, dit is een kruising tussen Sinzo en 
Hermitage, dat is waar die naam Pinotage vandaan kom, of, ja, of in, excuse, pin, pin, Pinot Noir in, 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 um, in Sanza, of Hermitage, dat is waar die naam Pinotage vandaan kom. En um, interessante story, hulle het, hulle het, die kultever was amper verloren, hulle het een paar uh, saakjes geplant bij Koetsenburg, by, net langs ons kelder, en hy was was op pad om die tuin skoon te maken. en toe gelukkig het een van die professeer hulle gestop, en toe twee of drie stokjes gereed, en daar vanaf het Pinotage nog verder ontwikkel, wat een van ons vlagskip weinde in Zuid-Afrika is. So ons is baie trots op die Pinotage. Ek het nog gewonnen dat ek die story vir julle moet vertel, maar ik denk ek ga dit maar vertel. Ons het, um, dit is eindelijk een waar story, as ek nou so kijk aan die trots, um, my van my collega's vertel, en daar vir my, hy het toch klas gegeen oor, vir die tweede jaar studenten oor, in wingerkunde, hoe mens natuurlijk nou, ek weet of julle weet, maar tijdens die wingerkunde, as druive ruip word, dan moet hulle blare uitbreek na by die troszone, dat daar meer licht op die troos val. Nou, dit is, dat is verskillende redes wat plaas vind van die metoxipirazine raak minder, en dit kan sekere positieve geere aan die wijn gee. Hy plaas het ook hier voor, hy is ou wingerkundig, hy sal weet wat van ek praat. Nou, um, die docent of die collega van my probeer te vir die studenten verduidelik, het like, jy kan nie te veel blare uitbreek, he, want dan vooral in die perel waar het warm is, kan die druive nou bykie seer kry van die son, en hy probeer te vir hulle verduidelik en vir hulle sê, jy weet, mens moet versichtig wees hoeveel blare jy rondom die troszone verweide, en hy giet vir hulle analoog, dat um, wat dan julle gaan gebeur, as ek nou net na die winter, as ek nou van 6 man en niks zon gehad, die kaal gaan le op, op Sandy Bay. Nou, julle kan nou dink, as die tweede jaar studentse antwoord daarop was redelijk interessant geweest, maar die antwoord was in elk geval te meneer, dan gaan jou troos verbrand. So, Ek geval nodeloos om te sê, hy moest die klas toe maar gestop het. Goed, maar jylle kan sê in elk geval die pinotaas en die melde troos verskil so bykie. Goed, so jylle is welkom om daar twee weine te proe. Um, aan die linke kant, as ek recht gaan douw, is die, was die eerste pinot melde? Nee, ek denk die melde is, was links, ja, of eerste. En dan kan jylle die pinotaas probeer. Ok, so het jylle al twee geproe. Hou jylle van die wijn? Wie verkies die melo? Kan jylle aanleiding vir my gee? Dit is persoonlijk enige, daar is nie recht of verkeerd nie. Wie verkies die pinotage? Wie prefer is die pinotage? Ok, it seems like the pinotage is leading the way. Ok. Goed, so al twee wijne, kan jylle sien, is lekker vol wijne, hulle is bykie redelijk sag, die tannine is redelijk goed geïntegreerd, denk ek, en wijne wat ons nog kan verouder, Um, baie belangrijk, as jy wijn verouder, is die temperatuur waarby jy wijn verouder. Jy, op jy, jy gaan die dierste bordel wijn koop, as jy hem op jy plafond sit, gaan jy binnen 6 maanden oor die meer wees. Ok, so, ek sal iets aan mense selfs, as jy vir jou goed koop, jy hoef nie vir jou dier wijn uh, ijskast te koop, jy koop vir jou el selfs een goedkoop tweedehandse ijskast, sit jou wijn selfs by 4 graden, dit is nog steeds baie beter, as wat dit by ons, en jy weet hoe warm moet in Stellenbosch en die perel word in somertijd, by ons is kalme temperatuur nie 20 graden in die somerie, en dit is baie slecht vir wijn, as dit by so hoog temperatie gestoor word. So, probeer al het jou wijn so koud as moeilijk stoor, jou wijn gaan langer verouder, en ook beter verouder. Ja, for those of you who think red wine gives you the gout, I think this quote is, is actually relevant. <laughs> so, feel free to drink red wine, I don't think it's going to make a big difference. Okay. Daar is natuurlijk hier die story oor die Franse paradox, wat hulle sê, die Franse drink baie rooi wijn, um, hulle eet, nie altijd gezond, wat ek nie altijd mee saamstem, maar um, hulle het minder hartsiektes, en natuurlijk, daar is mense wat, of daar is een lukke bewijse, dat rooi wijn speel wel een rol daar, so dat verhoed hartsiektes, en um, ander type siektes. So hulle, so they say, you would normally drink two glasses of red wine for a male per day, and one glass for a female, um, ok, dat is een help, jy drink two bottles over the weekend, and the, during the week nothing. So it's a gradual, continuous consumption, but that helps to keep you healthy. Goed, dankie, dan wil ek net vir die kelder graag bedank, ons weggeval in kelder, wat die wijn geskenk het vir die aand, 
in work the Institute for Gri Institute for Grape and Wine Sciences. They also donated some of the, um, which is part of our department. They've donated these compounds or stainers for you to to smell tonight. Okay, thank you. Dames en heren, kan ik net onze twee aanbieders en allerlei helpers van harte bedanken voor een baie, baie interessant. Ek, ek, gelukkig drink ek nie meer nie, want ek so vanaan baie bedruk gewees het, want hulle weet te veel van wijn wat vir my algemeen was, soos in die titel. Maar hartelike dank en um, dames en heren, baie dankie vir die deelname. Ek dink het was een baie lekker experiment om die gehoor as um, makproefkonijne te gebruik. Goeienaand.